Okay, a very warm welcome to everyone listening and viewing this third of our trio of webinars around uh, diversity and inclusion. Uh, this one in particular uh, brings home um, football and racism. The brutal killing of George Floyd brought into sharp focus the plague of racism that continues to exist and bringing this closer to home, the national game and the alarming rise in race, racist incidents in 2019-20 season, seen a 53% rise in racist incidents compared to previous seasons. Racism, racism is often labelled the US's greatest fault line. Is it actually football's greatest fault line? This webinar aims to deconstruct through debate how racism continues to manifest itself within the game and explores the solution-based way forward to ultimately erase this stain on the beautiful game. I'm absolutely delighted to present a panel that in their own right continue to push, prod and provoke debate within their, their work and ongoing observations within this area. We have Piara, Piara Power, Director of FAIR, Troy Townsend, Head of Development to Kick It Out, and also Paul Elliott, former player, but also currently chair of the FA's Inclusion Advisory Board. Paul, what I thought I'd do initially is just um, yeah, really give you the opportunity to set the scene. Uh, we've had 60 years of highlighting the issue within the game. Have we truly moved a dial? Butch, in truth, I think we have, but not at the speed that I think that everybody clearly wants. Um, I suppose I can relate to my lived experience as a player. Um, probably my career started in the late 70s, early 80s. And, and, and the reality is that was probably arguably, you know, in the most uh, brutal um, adversity because football really represented what society looked like, what communities looked like. You had such a strong visible presence from the National Front uh, in stadiums all over the country. And it was, you know, I suppose if I can correlate the modern day scene with what I was experiencing, if we look at what's happening with social media and we've witnessed the reprehensible, repugnant uh, racial abuse towards uh, black players, I think what I was doing, my generation was experiencing that on a weekly basis. It was normalized, it was standardized. There was no real legislative framework in place. And it wasn't until 1992, um, when I, John Fashionu, the PFA, we co-founded the, the Kick It Out organization, led by a great man of the highest order, Lord Herman Oosley, who in my opinion, has made more substantive change than most people I've come across, certainly in my three decades of uh, trying to campaign and make a positive contribution. So I think where we've seen evolution, black players, generally generally don't get as much direct abuse from supporters but obviously we've seen incidents obama young raheem sterling you know a number of incidents has gone on in the last 12 months where that ugliness has re-emerged in such a vociferous brutal way so i think we've seen greater diversity greater inclusion in stadiums modernized stadiums upgraded stadiums better technology, but we still know, you know, let's make no mistake here. This isn't about discrimination. This is out and out racism. Racism has never gone away. Football is not responsible for societal issues, but football's got a massive role to play. And I think football has come a long way since when I started my career. But I think we all have to recognise that societies change, societies evolve, and what football has to do now, collectively, is evolve and modernise with change. Thanks, Paul. Piara, are we moving the dial? I think Paul's made some very interesting points here, you know, and, and the first from me is to say that he's right to acknowledge the role of uh, Herman Usley. Uh, I think it's all fair to say that most of us on this call actually are sort of protégés of Herman. We were admirers of his work. We were brought into this field by him. Um, and he was the one who really brought the awareness of this issue and what was happening in football to, to the fore. He was the one who really started off, uh, triggered off a, a campaign against it uh, and started to tell football about its responsibilities. I think one of the, the issues that we have is that 
football has never really recognized the power that it has within British society. And, and actually across Europe, I would say the same thing. And, and it's always been, I, I think at first for a very long time, it was led by um, people who really didn't, weren't concerned about anything other than doing the day to day. I would, I would say that they the were probably the most qualified people to, to run a high level business. Uh, football had its roots in amateurism. They very much reflected those roots. And since then, I, I think football has developed. There's a lot more interesting things going on, but it still doesn't recognize the influence as it has as a cultural force. The fact that most people in this country, everyone from my five-year-old daughter to my almost 80-year-old mum, have some sort of interest in this game. Uh, and then what do you do with that power? What do you do with that leverage that you have? Racism is one of the things that it's failed to deal with. There's a whole load of other things that it could have given a, real, a, a lead on, that it hasn't done that. Uh, things like sexism, improving the role of women. It's only now, for example, that we see women's football growing. So I, I think it's a wider issue. I really love the framing of your question. Is racism football's great fault line? And I would say football's great fault line is probably the inability to see the power that it has historically. And if you, if you dig down beneath that, racism is certainly one of its biggest fault lines, yes. Thanks, Piara. Troy, um, with the work uh, th that you're doing at Kick It Out, we'll go into that a little bit um, uh, uh, later on. But right now, your commentary on uh, on where we are currently. Uh, I think I'm going to take a lead, first of all, from Paul and Piara in acknowledging um, Lord Herman Oosley. Um, I have a lot to be grateful to him for in terms of the way that he helped me progress in this industry. Um, Paul as well, Paul, who obviously gave me the opportunity, first of all, at Kick It Out. And without noticing it, Herman took me under his wing in terms of the way that he spoke, the way that he carried himself, the way that he taught me when and when, where to challenge, how to challenge, how to keep quiet at times, um, but definitely how to conduct yourself within the industry. And, and without him, I'm not sure we'd even be this far down the line. But um, I have to acknowledge that the game has moved on. When you hear and, and listen to the experiences of the likes of, of, of Paul Elliott, um, you realise what the game was like. Um, you know, we were what I, I could, didn't really watch from the stand. So I was watching from my TV screens and, you know, used to hear something from your TV screens. But you, you never really understood what the players were going through. Now, as I'm involved in the game, I absolutely understand what the players go through on a regular basis. And I don't think the game has shown enough towards the player, player welfare. I absolutely endorse what Piara says about the power of the game. I'm going to focus on the player from that side of it as well. The power of the player voice, sharing their experiences, um, acknowledging situations that has happened to them. You know, we, we, I don't think we've connected a player's mental well-being with racism enough. Um, and the impact of it. But we have we have to acknowledge that there's been some great work that's happening in this area and that will continue to happen. But every time there is a player victimised on a football pitch or on the new platform of social media because of the colour of their skin, it kind of shows how far we still have to go, you know. Um, and just an acknowledgement of, you know, that period of time in 2018 when we had Raheem Sterling speak up about his experiences that, you know, he wanted to talk about the media and wanted to hold the media to account. And people have spoken about that as a real seminal moment. And for the life of me, I cannot get over that a week before there was a banana thrown at a Bamiang on a football pitch back in England again. And it didn't seem as serious. We, the media didn't acknowledge it as an as a incident of racism. I'm not sure we did either within the game. Acknowledge it enough as an incident of racism. 1988, I go back to John Barnes playing at Goodison Park and receiving, you know, that iconic image of him back flicking that banana off the football pitch then. I never thought I'd witness anything like that again in English football. I did. And it's almost like we played it down. Um, that was a really disappointing moment for me because I think that was the moment when we really had to collectively come together, call things out for what they were as we saw it and then put action plans into place from there. So it's taken a period of time. 
Um, we're in now a period of time again when the microscope is absolutely on the game as to what it's going to be doing and the next stage. You mentioned George Floyd quite rightly. My question back will be, well, what have we achieved since the moment that, you know, everybody, sport acknowledged the the, the, the murder of George Floyd? Um, you know, Black Lives Matter coming into play and then being taken out of play, etc. cetera. Um, so for me, it's, it's a really important time, a really focused time for the game. The people that work in the game, people around the game, people that love the game, how how we could su sustain this conversation. Obviously, this platform has given us that opportunity to do that as well. Thanks, Troy. I think um, just picking up on a few points you've said already, but the intricacies and the nuances of trying to pick, unpick all the systemic issues that pervade the game with so many different stakeholders is a bit of a minefield. We've got clubs who make up the competition, coaches and managers who make up the staff, leagues that administer the competition, governing bodies that regulate the game, players that play, clubs, club owners who own it. Where do you start? And I want to really aim this question at PR as Director of FAIR, working closely with UEFA, but also NGOs across Europe. Is the approach top-down or bottom-up, PR? Well, I think the approach always has to be bottom-up because it's from the bottom upwards that the ideas are generated, that people talk to their own experiences, that people, um, if you like, are uh, agitating and pushing for change. I think if, if we didn't have the grassroots making those calls, then there wouldn't be any change because people at the top often sit in a, in a, in a comfortable environment and don't really think that much needs to change. I, I think in, in terms of what uh, the, the structure of football and the complex nature of the stakeholders, you know, I, I think one of the things that, that we call for everywhere we go is better regulation and application of regulations, whether it's through rules or whether it's through leadership, uh, whether it's the overall governance framework to be transparent and open uh, and every every sort of month of every season and you and you can test it uh, in this season that we just kicked off going forward there will be an incident somewhere in Europe which is being looked at by a governing body and for us the test is how is that governing body dealing with it right now you have um, the LFP the French League who are dealing with this big incident in, involving Neymar Jr. So for us, the question is, can they deal with it competently, transparently? Can they look at the issues and delve down to the satisfaction of that individual, the player who is the victim, but also to everybody else who's watching on, looking for the LFP and the French authorities to give a lead? And, and I think for me, that's the key thing. One can always make um, a case for the difficulties of, of implementing regulation effectively because the stakeholder framework is so complicated. Um, but, I, but I think that's where I come back to and that's where the grassroots uh, often has its biggest demands. That's where people at the top level, players um, that, that Troy's mentioned, that's where people want to see more action, more transparent action, action that actually satisfies the, the incidents that we're seeing. Thanks, Piara. Transparency and accountability is what I'm taking away from that, Troy. If we unpick this a little bit more with the work Kick It Out are currently doing and the statistics suggesting that alarming rise in rates of incidents last season, uh, the, the programmes that you've got, education, is that the only way we're going to gain any sort of traction on this change, Troy? Not the only way, but it's one of the most powerfulest ways that we don't talk up enough. Um, the education that goes into clubs, players, staff, parents. Um, I think football, well, I'd like to think that football leads in that sense. And it's not just through our work. There's many great uh, businesses that, that come into the game and educate and, and hopefully provide that platform for change, you know, because unless we highlight and recognise situations, then we're never going to get better at them. So I... I I believe the power of the player, the knowledge of the player, the understanding of the player is so much more progressive than what it ever has been before. Um, and without highlighting any kind of incidents, that's why players are not accepting certain things that are happening to them within a football club environment anymore. Um, and we've got to applaud that because it's supposed to be a safe environment for everyone to try and succeed and excel. And if they're going to be judged, let them be judged on ability alone. Um, I don't, there shouldn't be a, a, a massive, massively like 
overview of concern around the stats because the stats have been consistent for the past seven years. So I come from a point of where I've seen these stats on a regular basis, seen that racism is at the highest level of the, of, of the stats and yet wait for the reaction and what are we going to do about it? And I think, you know, every time I call for a bit of action, that is the little bit of action that I want to see is what are we going to do about stats that have been on the rise for the past seven years? But also the collective, the collective, the power of the collective, a voice sounds so much stronger if, if we are all uh, as authority figures um, are working closer together, if we all are singing from the same hymn sheet, but we've got to understand what that hymn sheet is. And sometimes what we've got to do is make sure that, you know, whether it's kick it out or whether it's whatever ever organizing it is, their voice is being heard to add to the conversation. Um, I think that's happening a little bit more now. But then how is that information being disseminated back into the public domain? Sometimes football fears the criticism, so keeps everything within. And I think we need to be more open, more transparent about the work that is going on within the game to battle and challenge um, the very act of, of, of the you know racism that still exists in the game. Piara, just picking up on um, Troy's point, the power of the collective. Yeah, I, I think, you know, one of the, the things that... that um strikes me, particularly when we're talking about stakeholders and we're talking about um, the impact on the player, the modern player on the pitch of racism and the other exclusions that we're going to talk about. I mean, I always wonder why players in England have never mobilised to form their own grouping, to form a, uh, what in the US, the MLS players, the black players come together uh, in an organisation called Black Players for Change whether we don't why we don't have that here and I, and I know reading in between the lines talking to a few people that there have been proposals on that it's been discussed internally but we've never really had that because that seems to me to be a stakeholder voice missing on a very important issue and i can see why people wouldn't want that but also add a great deal of power to to the arguments that those of us on the outside are making fair point um Here's another one, and, and, and Paul, I'm going to bring you in here, but are organisations doing enough? Does everyone actually recognise the issue of what it is? And is it now time for a collaborative approach? As chair of the Inclusion Advisory Group, are you not only scrutinised the In Pursuit of Progress strategy for a step change within uh, the FA, maybe we also have an answer now, Paul. You're shortly going to announce your voluntary code for equality in football leadership. This is a firm and, in, uh, and, and tangible commitment to diversity and inclusion in boardrooms, senior administration and coaching in grassroots, the semi-pro and the professional game. Can you share some more detail on where you are with this, Paul? Yeah, I mean, if I, I just want to sort of touch back as a, as a player and sort of relate that, correlate that with what I currently do. Because there's one thing when you talk about all generations, the last three generations, we've lost three generations of coaches and that's shocking, it's reprehensible. But there's one, there's one thing that everybody wants, and myself as a, as a black man, a man of color, whatever parlance you use, it's called equality of opportunity. When I was a player in, in, the, in the most hostile environment, all I ever wanted was that fundamental human right to work in a racism-free environment, just like people work in their offices, in their workplace, in schools. And I have, I have much sadness in a way that when I look at some of the, the, the evolution, there's been some real positively good work. And I think Troy references the education because your education never stops. Society has changed. Society has evolved. You know, and, and, and the 21st century, you know, there's so much more to be done. But I've always believed, and, when, and, and leading to the point about when I give consideration to the code, if there was one disappointment I had, I believe the whole of football should be inextricably aligned in this area of equality, diversity and inclusion. Football's got this amazing power, probably three billion people, you know, watch the Premier League, uh, you know, every year. The, um, the EFL is probably, the, you know, the fifth most watched uh, league in Europe. And, and I'm, and, and it sort of leads into my thinking about the uh, football leadership I just say EDI code for all. That's 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 the simple name that I. And if I'm honest with you, I was inspired by two people. Believe it or not, one was Raheem Sterling, 
because I remember him saying, when he looks up, he doesn't see people that look like him. And if you can't see it, how can you be it? So what he's saying about role models, when he looks up in football and football clubs, boards, he can't see that. And also Jermaine Defoe, who I've got a tremendous uh, high regard for, when he said, you know, that an unbelievably distinguished career, he actually said publicly, I'm not sure if it's worth me doing my coaching qualifications because I don't think I'll get a job. So it comes back to my point. So when I give consideration to that, so many people has been talking about the problem. And I think it's important that people talk about the problem because we are all, one thing we are all of us on this phone call, you know, we care. We want to make a positive contribution. And everybody's trying in their own space, whether it's trying to kick it out, PR in fair, yourself, watch at the grassroots, myself, whatever hats I wear. But I have a lived experience that's so important and that drives my motivation for change as best as I possibly can within obviously the structure that I work in. So that inspired my thinking. And I remember speaking with uh, the CEO, Mark Bullenham, who's a very good guy. Um, this area is one of his key strategic priorities. And I says, Mark, we, you know, there's an idea that I've got that I feel when you speak to people, people want to see greater diversity in senior leadership, extended leadership teams, senior management, coaching. Then you have to work yourself backwards, back to the recruitment, the integrity of the recruitment process, the transparency of it, you know, diverse panels, education, unconscious bias training. Where I'm coming from is a model that I believe if it's supported and uh, appropriately, it will make a positive contribution to change English football. Because the beneficiaries of that is currently stands in the PFA, they're 4,500 members. So I'm looking at a model where there's targets for people of color, um, gender, black women, and I feel that the key areas it's got to be is senior leadership, executive, senior management teams, coaching. They're the key areas. And then looking at the whole um, Rooney Rule principle to go beyond that. So when jobs become advertised, there'll be a central domain where all jobs advertised will go through. And people from a, you know, women from an ethnically diverse background, players, staff, whoever, if they meet the criteria, they will get an interview. I think that's very important. That's male okay. and female. So that was really the framework of the, um, obviously, I'm, you know, with limited time, I can't yeah. get much further, but that's the framework of it about providing a, a model of accountability. So clubs are held to account by signing up to this. And Paul, then, I want to I wanna bring Troy in just for a yeah. moment because I remember um, uh, reading an article, your, your recent Guardian article, which you, you praised Paul and the work that, that's been done in this area. But I think there was a question mark over the word voluntary, Troy. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll respond to Troy. That's fine. Troy. Go on, Paul. No, I mean, Troy, we, when we discuss this, because what I've done, I put together an organisational structure. Your chair, Sanjay, sits... Uh, on, yeah. on the main steering group. So it was a main board that captured what I call diversity of thinking. So I had owners, chairman, players, coaches, male, female, black, white, HR, um, and, 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 and so on. And the, on the very, very first meeting, um, the, the discussion was held. Why does it have to be voluntary? Because obviously they were looking at the other voluntary code within the EFL, uh, and obviously everybody has their own opinions about that. And we, having spoken with Mark, we, it was after taking legal advice, it was confirmed that, that you could not have a mandatory ruling in that space. And also, when I thought more about that, I want people to sign up to this. I want clubs to sign up to this. I want stakeholders to sign up to this. Not because it's mandatory, but because they think it's the right thing to do. Now, some people may say we're at a juncture now in football or in society, in the world, that, that this should be mandatory. But I, I feel, you know, 
if you try and hold a gun to people's head in, in football, I really don't think you you are you get effectiveness in that way, particularly around this area. But everybody's got their own opinion. But I felt that you know if the, the point was made even by some black coaches, why can't we why can't we make this a mandatory uh, 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 targets or mandatory for clubs to sign up? And I says, well, well it, the point was made. There was a legal person in the room um, saying that. Um, as far as they're concerned, it wouldn't be uh, legally enforceable, and you couldn't make clubs sort of make it a mandatory uh, mandatory code, which was accepted. Troy, yeah, I just wanted to pick up on uh, what Paul said there, and you know, he's talking about decor- you know the decorated figure of a Jermaine Defoe, you know, and I'm going to throw Danny Rose into the hat there as well because you know he said exactly what Jermaine said. It, it's pointless, you know, doing coaching badges or. When they finish the game, the game is not for them. And we've got to look deeper into what they're saying there. They're talking about the game that has kind of accepted them for the playing side of it, the entertainer, the 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 the, the, the international representative as such, but yet will not doesn't seem interesting in them after they finish the game. And I hear this from a number of players who say that they don't feel that they can they can continue their careers as such after they finish playing and and for me that that says something massively for me is what are they saying about the game are they saying that the game fundamentally is 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 a racist industry you know are they saying that the the lack of opportunity for black players when they finish the game narrows to to well the percentages that we have now so i think what we've got to do also is hear and listen to the voices of those people and and kind of break down what the issue is you know why is it a problem why do they think that way and and again it's just on another point paul's points so i just wanted to see also about what the the stakeholders in the game the authorities the governing bodies are they taking the same stance to this leadership code will they be leading by example in terms of also looking within and and you know looking at their represent, representation and, and trying to do something about that as well so that the game can see that the leaders of the game are taking on the same aspects of this code as what the, the clubs and the the, the others are, are being asked to do. Paul? Yeah, I mean, listen, I mean, indeed, they're valid points. I think the key thing about what the modern day player is doing, they're talking up. Their lived experience, in my opinion, is the most powerful, potent armory they have because people have to listen to the players and i think the modern day player they're far more socially conscious than ever before Mm -hmm. in my players group i've got harry kane jordan henderson tyrone mings troy deeney wes morgan lucy bronze nikita paris and leah williamson they form my expert panel and listening to them speak they're more aware of con- the consciousness that they have, the modern day player has. I think it's it's fantastic. And that's why now I think there's a window. This is, we, I call it a window of opportunity. Mm-hmm. The players now have got more power than ever before. So it's about how you use that power to affect change. And those players want to affect change because those players and once other stakeholders have inputted into, into the code. And, and what I captured in that was diversity of thought. That's been the key to getting where we're getting to. So when we spoke about, for example, the coaches, because I think we're all cognizant of the issues of the coaches, I wasn't aware, but this is again, where the, in the absence of a lack of data analysis, there's over a thousand coaches from, from a BAMI background that's got a, 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 a UA for B, you know, level three qualification. So many people, I've been in conversations where people have says, we're not, the pipeline's not there, the talent pool is not there. It is there. It's supported by the, the, the evidences there, by this data. So when I was going through the whole discussions with uh, clubs and owners and stakeholders, I can say to you that collectively they want to change. So I've said, listen, this isn't about talking anymore because I've been talking for 30 years. I've listened to conversations for 30 years. This is about converting that into a sustainable model where Governance is key, because a lot of this is about governance, but it's also about accountability. Clubs who sign up to this have to say, we are, we're going to put our diversity data out there, and every year there's going to be an independent audit, and we're going to publish our figures and be transparent. And the, and the other party I spoke about, that the other entity that I didn't include in that was the media. You know, we've got the media, they actually realise now that 
change has to happen. So what I'm what I've simply tried to say to clubs is that you have to do this because you believe in it. But I'm at a juncture personally now. Me, the last 30 years, what I've seen come, what I've seen go, I want it doesn't matter to me why people do it, just do it. Because all of us on this call knows the benefits and the upside that current and future generations, not just of people of colour, but also of women, also of ex-players. Because I think there's been a myth about ex-players, whether you're black or white, but ex-players having careers beyond football, say football administration and governance. Well, why not? They've played the game. Nobody could, as long as you've got then the education to support that, which is important, you know, which, which is obviously a continuation of your footballing education. So the targets that we've, the, the, that we've put together, you know, it facilitates for that area, targets in the ball, you know, the executive, senior management, coaching. But the, one of the key aspects for me was the recruitment, you know, where jobs are advertised. Because I've seen from my, my own experience, you put things out there, you, you don't even know. All of a sudden, somebody turns up next week at job. Well, how did that happen? Was that process transparent? Where is it advertised? The wording of the advertised? Does it go out to certain areas of the community where they can access that? There's an, um, and, and to be honest with you, there's been some really frank, open discussions. And one area that in particular pleased me has been where we've had a big challenge, you know, regarding uh, uh, people of colour, uh, women from an ethnically diverse background, where they've been totally left on the side. And there was a really challenging conversation where there was nine women of colour on the, on, on, on the call, and it was chaired by Hope Powell, that I've got a great amount of respect for. And to listen to their narrative, their journey, and how they felt, and how they felt they've been excluded and marginalised, that's when I realised, hey, that taught me a lot. We're here concentrating on, on the players, and I get that because 30% or so players that play the game are black. So that's why this code, it was important that it's for all. And another point I want to say, if you think about all the positive action programmes out there, think about Black Lives Matter, think about No Room for Racism, Think about the word that Kick It Out does. Show racism the red card. The elite players, uh, place, the elite players uh, placement program. You think about the, the, the Rooney rule. You think about the recent initiative that the, that the Premier League launched in conjunction with the, uh, with the PFA for five or six coaches. This code underpins all of that. It's, it's, it's woven into that because this code is for all. So it actually replaces, because there's one thing, I've had enough conversations with uh, Piara, not so many conversations with you, Tri, I've had conversation with you and I and I know, we are at a phase now where there has to be targets. Targets for clubs to sign up to, to deliver. And clubs be held, and football be held to account. And this is Paul, all the FA. Paul, I'm, I'm going to bring in Piara. Targets for clubs, um, socially conscious players, Thoughts, PR. You know, I, I think actually on the socially conscious players piece, I, I think um, Troy is absolutely right. Paul is absolutely right. You see a level of consciousness now. And whether you can say it's about a new form of athlete activism led by athletes in the US, or whether it's people just responding to their environment and, and responding to injustice. You know, I think what Marcus Rashford has achieved this summer has been incredible. Absolutely incredible. And then you see the backlash against him, some of it led by elected members of parliament. You know, so he, he's doing uh, something very, very right when you've got MPs who are disagreeing with him and when all he wants to do is feed young kids. You know, I, I think that's a great, great development in football. We didn't see that before. We haven't seen that before. People yeah. were exp expressing themselves privately and didn't really understand perhaps the leverage that they, that they had publicly. And, and it goes back to my earlier point, actually. I, I still often wonder why the black players don't come together uh, because the mainstream seems to be misrepresenting them or not representing them adequately. It's something I just want to leave out there again. I think in terms of codes and, and the difference in terms of voluntary codes and mandatory codes, in the end, I, I think we have to say that the EFL voluntary code hasn't worked. I don't think we would be um, giving our audience here that are watching um, any credit or respect if we if we didn't call that out 
as a failed attempt at something very noble. I don't remember any manager that's been or, or, or head coach that's been appointed uh, since lockdown where the code was said to have been used in the, in the 72 football league clubs. So it's not working. And actually, in its design, it was flawed. It, it was set up to, to respond to the debate and the arguments that were being made, the criticisms that were being made. Uh, and this idea that an entity can step in and outside of an obligation um, is, is, is not going to work. The way that Paul, the, the, the little that I know about Paul's code, um, the idea that you voluntarily get involved with it, but once you're in, then you have to declare your data, you have to set targets, you have to be subject to uh, baseline measurements that are objective, I think is the way to go. My hope would be that we get a significant number of Premier League clubs and EFL clubs that are involved, and then it begins to to, to gather momentum. I, I, I think that the problem is now is that sometimes, because of the, the, the complex stakeholder relationships that we have in English football, because of the failure of leadership in the past, we sometimes are grappling um, at, at easy solutions, at solutions that are not going to be successful, and, and we are a little bit desperate. But I, I think the framing that Paul gives it, as I say, I haven't really heard anything uh, about the code except what's out there in public. If people sign up and then they're obliged to, to be transparent, then that is uh, a good step forward. And they're using recruitment techniques like the Rui rule. That's, I, I think, very, very, very positive. Thank you. I, think, I think we're in a moment in time here where, yet again, people have to really turning their focus on the game and the actions that, that we're right. We're talking about actions. The talking has done. We've, we've spoken every time there's been a massive incident in the world or generally in football. I, I absolutely endorse what Piara says about the EFL code. Uh, I, I've called it not fit for purpose because it just, it wasn't designed right from the outset. And I, I'm not sure who, who spoke or influenced the way that it was designed, but there's a loophole that there for clubs and clubs have taken it. And it's not the club's fault. It's in it's, it's in its design mechanism. You know, if we were in a per perfect space, all this work would be done organically anyway. If we were in a perfect space, football has to understand and appreciate its failings to move forward. And if we can move forward and take everybody on the journey... And when I say everybody, I mean those that are in influential positions, those it's really enlightening to hear the people that Paul is speaking to in, in terms of players groups, because we're now giving the voice to the player, the player that have been that has been inspired for many, many years by historical stories that understands the, you know, the, the likes of a Cyril Regis, a, 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 a Laurie Cunningham, a Clyde Best and, and beyond into a, a Paul Elliott's age, age group and range. Paul said something from the outset about losing, I think it was Paul, maybe PR, about losing another age group of, of coaches. Another, you know, we've got to look at ourselves and ask ourselves why, because that Rooney rule is not, you know, I've spoken enough to Ricky Hill to know what he presented 30 odd years ago in terms of how football could have changed back then. Um, so this is a moment where we have to stay on it and have to acknowledge what is being put in place now. And, and as we've all said, I think, and hold you know, those to account who do sign up. I think it's really positive that clubs are, but I think also is we cannot we cannot let loosen the rod as such. We need to make sure that it remains tight and remains positive. Just, 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 to add, just to add to that, Troy, actually, um, I, I, I think like you and like Paul, I personally am a very optimistic person. I consider myself a positive person. Um, and I, I see a lot of good ideas coming out as to how we can create the sort of changes that are needed. I don't see people, sometimes these conversations can be framed negatively. Mm. We are criticizing people. We are trying to hold people to account. But I talk to a high level diversity expert here and in the, in, in the US at least twice a month. Uh, and, and always thinking about how you can transfer things that have been successful in the banking sector or, or the IT the tech, the, the tech entities over in Silicon Valley, how we can bring that into sport, how we can bring it into football. There are a lot of good ideas out there. And I think once we start on a road where there is space for those ideas, because people want to implement and do things, then, then I think that's a good place to be. We yeah. haven't yet got to that place. So I'm hoping no. that Paul's initiative is going to take us down that road. Yeah. yeah. Can I run in on another point as well? I think it was important because Troy made a significant point about 
you know, um, the stakeholders. And when I spoke with Mark and I created this concept, I says, Mark, the FA has to take their lead and take their responsibility in this as well. Um, and, and to his credit, I was supported previously, as you know, when I created that elite players uh, placement program with the coaches, the visibility, you know, your Chris Powell's, your, 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 you know, your um, Michael Johnson's uh, under 21s and Chris Powell, the seniors. And it was exemplified perfectly when it went off in Montenegro and Bulgaria. And Chris Powell was a brilliant role model advocate for those players to look up to. And when you got that visibility with him with Gareth on the bench, I thought it was unbelievably so powerful. So they're listening and they are still ha and, and they and they're and they're listening about this. And, and the point I'm getting to was that I said to Mark, Mark, if we're gonna ask football to do this, if we're asking clubs and stakeholders to sign up, it's important that the FA sets the lead. It takes that leadership. Um, and I said to him, one of the key areas that I thought that we were lacking within the FA was when I spoke about the you know the targets around the um, the SMT, you know, the executive. And there was a, a role advertised, and uh, this lady, she, I interviewed her for my IAB board. Her name is Edlyn John. Edlyn is a black woman from Lewisham. She got a scholarship to go to Cambridge, and she's worked in four massive corporates as a diversity and inclusion uh, expert. There was a process, and Edlyn was appointed um, director of international uh, affairs and uh, um, leading. Uh, co-chairing or co-leading on the equality diversity uh, EDI across the FA. So that's in the senior senior executive area. So for me, in my opinion, that's a really positive step forward. I don't know how much traction they've got out there, but I see that as hugely significant that you've got a woman of colour in those very senior executive positions. And by the way, you know, she's got a formidable CV. This isn't tokenism, because that's one thing that's always bothered me, where I hear that word tokenism so much. It's a, She's there and all our players, you know, how many times have we heard our, our players saying, even when it comes to the elite placement program, you know, we don't want tokenism. I don't want tokenism. Nobody wants tokenism. But as I said to players, we've got over a thousand coaches that's got a UA for B license. That's not tokenism. So I get frustrated when I hear the words because I think sometimes it's been that historical exclusion and marginalized it knocks you down, it wears you down. And I just think what's really mobilized me is seeing over the last three or four months, yes, the impact of George Floyd was only was really relevant because my dad lives in the States. The number of killings has gone on over the years. Mm -hmm. The reason why George Floyd was so potent because the world was in lockdown. They're in their front rooms or they had access to the internet. So when they saw this senseless brutality, uh, this, this, this death of this man in such a brutal and callous way, that started then to open people's eyes about institutional, structural, systemic racism that's been in, in America's DNA. But we also know it's also the same in the United Kingdom. It's no different, but it's just more subtle here. That's the difference. How can we keep this at the top of the agenda? What action can be taken once we get off the knee to lead to transformational changes to race equality in football? Troy. Uh, but you say once we get off the knee, you know, there's a lot of talk about this knee at the moment and some clubs have now stopped it, some continue, and then all of a sudden it becomes this wave of topic or conversation. Why are they not taking the knee? You know, I think, I, personally, the knee is very powerful for me and it always has been. And long may it continue, by the way. But it's not the sole focus of what everybody wants to achieve. And I think sometimes when these mixed messages, as Paul's just said, get out, they get out to fuel other people's agenda. So it's fueling the media's agenda to be able to say, well, why didn't QPR and Coventry take the knee, you know, the other night? That's a personal decision. That's a club decision. The knee is the point of us starting conversation. Again, the conversation has to then move into the board level rooms, if you want to be totally honest, because below that, we've always had the conversation. The, the conversation has always been there, but the board level room to shut to, for ownership, to take ownership, to take leadership, to then appreciate and understand what happens at those levels and move forward. So I don't want to judge anything yet until we get Paul's leadership code out. 
we then you kind of understand the full intricacies of, of what that means for everybody involved in the game. What the Premier League are going to do, what the PFA are going to do. You know, George Floyd only happened at the end of May. And my question at the moment is what, what has changed? Jacob Floyd was shot in the back after that, you know, and like Paul's absolutely identified. I've got people out in America who are scared at the moment. They're worried. But what I'm pleased about is the solidarity and power that it has produced amongst sports people to stand up, identify um, and be able to talk on an issue that many feel that it hasn't been their place to talk about before. So you've highlighted Marcus Rashford on, on one scale. But, you know, let me highlight Ben Mee on another scale after getting thrashed 5-0 by Man City at the start of Project Restart and the, com the, the, the presenter wanting to talk about the five goals that, that Manchester City had conceded. And Ben Mee had something more important to address because it was the most important thing on his mind at the time. And that was that airplane flying over the, the, the Etihad. Let me take it out of football just for one minute. I'm not a Britain's Got Talent fan, by the way, so don't judge me here. But that performance by diversity in acknowledging the social injustices that have existed around the world for far too long. Diversity were the public's favourite dance group. Now there's 25,000 complaints about diversity because they brought politics into, into you know, the, the dance industry. That shows you where we are. For every powerful voice, there's many of those little voices that have something to say, although they will never want to understand and appreciate what we've gone through for far too long. I'm not even sure if I've answered your question properly, Butch, but I wanted to almost get that off my chest to show whilst we, we are making progress, and I think all of us on this call know that we've made progress because we've all been involved in bits. That progress now has to be sustainable, um, it has to be measured and it, and it is going to be and it has to be we have to be vocal about it as well. For me, football stays too quiet in this space about what it's proactively doing, how it's proactively addressing certain situations. So we have to be able to articulate it to the outside world who always want to criticise the game for the amount of money that it has. And that will be the end of their argument, full stop. Yeah, can I, what, can I come on the back of that quickly? Because I think... I do agree with the, I saw the knee thing as symbolic, a sense of unity, solidarity. And I remember saying publicly, that will never be enough. It raises it in the consciousness visibly, but you need a sustainable action plan from the touchline to the boardroom where there's measurements, interventions, targets, and accountability and delivery. That aligned with the need of solidarity, what it means, I think then, excuse the soft parlance, you're starting to cook with some gas. And I think, it comes back to my point, this is one area now, in my opinion, the good that must come out, because I think we also, like Pierre, I'm, I'm an optimistic guy, and you must take good out of the most extreme adversity. But I think now, people are talking in a way that they've never spoken before. I think now, the game recognises now it's no longer about solution. It's no longer about action. It's about a sustainable solution now. And what I'm saying is, what I've developed, I'm not sure if that's going to be the answer. I'd like to feel that it's making a positive contribution to shift the dial to bring the game in another better place. It might be just a foundation. And then in, in a number of years' time, like a house, you build on that foundation. But there has to be a structure, a sustainable model that captures the whole of the stakeholders. And this isn't the FA owning this or Paul Elliott owning this or the Premier League owning it or the LMA or the PFA or kick it out. This is for football to own. Football owns this and football has to take the lead and be responsible for its delivery. Piara? You know, I, I think the guys have spoken so well on this issue, the, the need to, um, to take the window that's been created um, in some people's minds and knowing actually that for many people, uh, this may not be on their agenda in a year's time in the way that we want it to be. So, so utilizing the space that we have, putting in place things that are gonna be long lasting. In the end, 
we have this space to talk because we profess to be change makers. We profess to be the people who can lead or be involved in leading a movement. So we have obligations on us. Uh, and I'm always conscious actually also that there will be people watching who are victims to what's mm. gone on in this country and will be victims in the future. So I'm optimistic, but I also know the responsibility that I have to keep pushing, to keep developing, having ideas, implementing those ideas, and making sure that we're not just talking about this stuff, but we're delivering. And also pure challenging as well. Challenging. We all have to be challenged, you know. When I'm challenged, I think it, it raises my game. If I challenge Troy, I expect Troy to be reactive in the same way. When I challenge you, PR, I'd expect the same. So we together not only have to challenge each other, because we all, and because one thing, the common, the, the golden thread amongst all of us is we all care. We want change. We've seen adversity, we've lived through it, we want change. So uh, my job, I have to challenge the FA. I have to challenge my board. I have to challenge the, you know, where I can optimize every single conceivable leverage because it's about doing the right thing. If, if I'm going to pick up on that just very quickly, I think yeah. that's where the game lets itself down as such. It almost doesn't like the challenge, doesn't like to be called out, doesn't like to, to see certain situations addressed. And I think if we can be more comfortable with dealing with that mm. because of the purpose behind it and the reasoning behind it, and then the opportunity to open up platforms of further conversation, then we'll, we'll find that I, I'm not in this game. I'm not in the game to, to, to belittle anybody, to, 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 you know, to make the game a, a, a worse environment. I want the best for everyone. I don't care what colour of your skin are, but ultimately I'm being judged on being a black man and supporting initiatives that help better representation. And if I don't feel, or as an organisation, we don't feel that that is happening, we have to be able to talk about that and we have to be able to express our views. And this is one of the biggest things for me moving forward. I hope the game has this openness to be able to listen, learn and act. Well, I think, Troy, if we look at the, you know, the, the, the biggest single change, in my opinion, that I've seen for a number of years has been the consciousness and the articulation and the confidence of the modern day player to speak yeah. a way that I take my hat off to. Yeah. Across, yeah. not just, you know, EDI, but across yeah. a whole range of... All sort platforms, of yeah. There is a Plat point that I've got the greatest admiration for. And we have to, you know, we have to support them. We have to call people out. And we have to underpin that in this area that's so important and integral to us, where there's that visible underrepresentation. I, 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 I can't tell you how powerful this is is coming over as a as a webinar as well. Um, some really key points from all three key panelists about conversations moving into the boardroom, uh, the touchline to the uh, from touchline to the boardroom. Listen, learn, and act. And some really, really powerful messages and real call to action as well. And we are now coming into that month, October, the first Black History Month, uh, where we acknowledge and the incredible contribution of black people throughout the UK. Um, and I was going to ask for a call to action, but I've already heard it. But what I would like you all in the, in the last question, and, and it's a challenge to everyone, is if we looked forward five years, like I asked Paul to set the scene when we first came. So we've talked a little bit about what it looked like in the past, where we are currently and what our hopes and aspirations are. My final question to each and every one of you, I'm going to start with PR first, is if you were doing a commentary in 2025, what would it sound like? Then it's over to Paul and then to Troy. I'm hoping that it will sound like, I'm hoping actually that it will be uh, infused with a new way of thinking that football has, has begun to develop, that there's more honesty in looking internally, that there's more action uh, and the successes of that action can be documented and put out there. And that people are feeling more comfortable around football, feel and understand that it's more inclusive, that there are more opportunities, that we can move together as a whole rather than, than as, as fractured pieces. Uh, and actually that everybody recognises the benefit that has for football. Fantastic. Paul? Yeah, I mean, I, I think what I'd like to see in five years' time, I would like to believe that the code has evolved and we've got that diversity of thought 
that I think underpins this, that's evident and incrementally from the touchline to the boardroom. So it becomes, the diversity actually becomes such a potent, visible, normalized, standardized thought. And it's reflected in people's behaviors because what that does, and it affects, changes culture then. When you have a naturally diverse and inclusive organization, I think that's one of the most powerful things to see. Not just for the, the socio and the human upside, but there's a massive economic upside to diversity, which we've probably not gone through. So I want to see where diversity, where people just appreciate that difference is great. It's great to be different, and that should be reflected in decision-making processes. Because there's nothing better when you have a room of people that's diverse. That's the only way you learn. This journey I've been on for the last four months, I've had about 50, 60 meetings, and, and it's come from the world, you know, from lockdown. It wouldn't be able to, it wouldn't be able to happen otherwise. I wouldn't be able to have implemented this and had the administrative support from the organisation. Because how could I pull all these players, clubs, media, you know, <laughs> you know, together in one forum? And what's really blown me away, the single most potent thing has been it's the measurement and the effectiveness of diverse and inclusive opinions and views and behaviours. That's what's yielded the success. So for me, that's the key to sustainability uh, that I'd like to see in the next five years. Troy, it's 2025. What's your commentary? Butch, you, in your opening, uh, you mentioned we've been fighting this for 60 years. Um, plus an acknowledgement that that is really going back to you know the time of someone like a water toll so actually we've been challenging this for many many a year beyond that as well culturally the game has always looked the same isn't it culturally the game has always looked the same there will be many who will who won't like change and will resist change in their own little way in their own little bubble in their own little space we, we have an opportunity now to change mindsets, to change attitudes, to change the way that people have always seen the game and accepted the game. Um, the, you know, from a personal experience, I, I wouldn't want anyone that looked or sounded like me in 2025 walk into a boardroom and be asked, are you in the right place? I want it to become natural. I want it to become easy for someone to to be in that environment because that's one of the highest levels of the game. So to be in that environment and be accepted in that environment. Paul said something earlier about the code, how it's just the platform. So in 2025, I hope that platform has been built on massively so that these conversations may be a no more, but we're talking about a different conversation in progressing individuals even more, you know, um, but we're open about that. So there's no more excuses. The data, the stats, and everything that has to be kind of pulled together is pulled together and is publicly displayed without it being hidden in any way, without us having to ask, you know, so that we are becoming an open environment for everybody, a space where we all can succeed because of our ability, because of our attitude towards change, um, rather than being held back you know, if we're still talking about 2025, visibility, people being held back, um, data shows that the pipeline's there, and we're still talking about those those words in 2025, then we've not achieved, and it's time to leave and give it to someone else who, who will advocate for that change and will, will challenge and, and hopefully be able to get the change that we've been looking for. I do not want to lose another cohort of good people because the game is not an open environment for them to express themselves in, for them to work in, and for them to be part of the kind of change that I think we all want. That is fantastic. Gentlemen, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, informative, insightful, inspirational. Um, thank you so much for your time. Absolutely outstanding. Thank you. Cheers, Butch. Thanks, Butch. You had the easy part. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.